Peace, peace, peace. So this is an impromptu IG Live. And if you happen to be listening on the streaming platforms of Rhetorically Speaking, which is the Spotify's, the Apple's, the SoundClouds, or if you're watching on YouTube, again, hit that subscribe button somewhere in there. Um, and count yourself lucky, because this was just supposed to be an, an IG Live. So I was debating about whether I was going to have an episode this week just because... I'm exhausted. For those of you who who don't know, I got a lot of things popping off. One of them is that I'm a professor at an HBCU, Delaware State University in particular. I've been there now about three years. This is supposed to be my second year as a as a full time professor. So I'm full transparency, like I'm 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 struggling with the idea of of staying at this institution i've 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 hinted at it a little bit in my like ig story it's just the just not being content with the treatment of not only myself but of professors at the university and i don't think this is necessarily endemic to Delaware State University. It's also happening at universities across the country where there's an there's an increased focus and understandably so what up Carolyn? Understandably so on this idea of customer service at the university. I can't speak to what happens at predominantly white institutions, but I know at, at HBCUs and at Delaware State specifically Customer service has been is being promoted as the top priority, and understandably so. It's the idea that, despite the the recent increase in individuals choosing choosing an HBCU, unless it's a Howard, unless it's a uh, Hampton, not, not, maybe not even Hampton, unless it's a, a Spelman or a Morehouse, they're struggling to, to get people and struggling to keep people. Now, again, they've seen an increase. I know at Delaware State, this is the biggest incoming freshman class in a very long time. I'm not going to just uh, attribute that to, to what's happening with the affirmative action being struck down by the Supreme Court and it's in the way that that some folk understand it but this has been something in the making for a a long time I think where black folk this next generation of of kids are saying yeah I'm going to tap into my blackness I want to be around black folk and so we're, go we're not going to the predominantly white institution and so that's a beautiful thing. What I always caution people, and I'm not going to act like this is an original idea. The HBCU acts like a predominantly white institution. That's exactly how it's run. Now, let's think about it in terms of just the student body, right? Yes, the, the predominant, they're predominantly going to be black, black kids, black students, black learners sprinkling some brown and there there will be some white folk that that you know which find themselves on the campus but ultimately it's going to be black students which is the idea that we have when we think about the hbcu what's lost in that is what's happening on the faculty side now we know that tenures tenureship isn't being offered at a rate that it once was they're bringing in a whole bunch of adjunct faculty into not only HBCUs, but just universities in general, because you get to pay adjuncts less. That's how I got my start. That's how a lot of people get their starts in, in academia, by taking the adjunct route. So I became an adjunct in 2020, the, the summer of unrest, the summer of George Floyd, the, the, the summer of and the year of, of COVID and the pandemic. And I took it because I said, hey, you know what? Yeah, I have no problem teaching research, even though I hadn't had a research class in about 10 years, but I was starting a doctoral program. And sometimes you just got to say, 
you're you just got to say, hey, I know how to do it, even if you don't. So I appreciate that that white woman <laughs> that that um, that hired me for for that position. Um, the thing about being an adjunct is it's. And, I, and it, for lack of lack of better words, it's slave labor. Being an adjunct at any university is slave labor. Um, you don't get paid a lot. There aren't any benefits. And this is magnified if it, if you're at a at an HBCU, or if listen, I taught at Grand Canyon University for about two weeks. And I realized, like, it, it really dawned on me, like, I was getting $800 to teach a six to eight week course where the requirements of the professor was for me to, and it being online only, was to check in three times a week and, and correspond with students on their the learning platform, to respond to emails within 24 hours, to have grades to have assignments and quizzes graded within within five to seven business days for eight hundred dollars, but they get away with it because a lot of people want to be in the academy and for noble reasons, I fashion myself just an educator in general, where no matter where platform I'm at I'm always going to be educated that's the reason why I got you good man rhetorically speaking, whether it's a Dell state classroom whether it's it's the actual you good man meeting in per in person or just having conversation with folk. I want to learn because that's part of being an educator and being in that environment. I'm coming as as an, not only as an educator but also as a learner, and so that's how they get people. And so my experience at Dell State, listen, I was somebody who because I haven't had a full time job since 2011. This was my first full time job in 10 years. 12, 11 years because I was strategic about that. I said, listen, once I left the city of Philadelphia, I will never get a job where uh, my heart wasn't in it or I felt demeaned or I didn't have flexibility. It was a problem being a police adjacent and working for child welfare, um, doing, uh, doing the work of, of white supremacy. That just never sat right with me. But being at this HBCU and being an adjunct, because of my love for black folk, because of my love for 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 learning, I was just like, yo, I'm committed to it. Now I, I do teach as an adjunct at at Stockton University in Jersey. And to <laughs> to juxtapose the two, what I make it for teaching one class at Stockton as an adjunct, I make teaching 2.25 classes, or I was when I taught 2.25 classes here at Delaware State. So it wasn't about the money. But now we're in a position where, and this is where I, and, and I got no problem. I don't care if anybody from Dell State is on the, the chair, the dean. I'm in protest mode. And you might be like, Phil, why are you in protest mode? So I've been a, a lecture two. So they, they hired me full-time faculty, a lecture two. So I wasn't an assistant professor, which is understandable. Okay, I didn't have my doctorate at the time. Even though there are universities where you can be an assistant professor with just an MSW or whatever, whatever um, graduate level degree you might have. So in the midst of this, knowing I was graduating in May, I was like, all right, you know what? Let me interview for this assistant professor position. Interviewed at the end of the last fall, beginning of the spring sometime, and was told I was the number one person out of all the people they, 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 um, that they interviewed. Of course I am, because I'm me. I know how I give it up in the classroom setting. There's no need to be humble about that. They're not fucking with me. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Re respectfully. Um, I'm unique and just the skills that I that I bring. Uh, somebody said I was a unicorn. I'm a black man in, in social work of a certain age doing real community work, like really out here in these streets. I'm not sitting here, sitting behind a laptop, just just churning out articles and shit. You know, um, even though I recognize that if I want to get tenured at some point, that's part of the game. Um, and so it went dark. Didn't hear anything from him. Reached out, reached back out 
to the universe. And this is my fault. This is where advocating for yourself is so important. This interview might have happened at the end of fall, beginning of spring. I didn't reach back out until May and say, yo, so what's up with this position? And I was told, hey, it's a hiring freeze at the university. And I was like, ah, okay, got you. That just didn't make sense to me. Because we're talking about a university and a, and a hiring freeze is, wow, yeah, Carl, when they, they, they make a brother feel good. <laughs> they, even though they don't take taxes out. So then when the tax man come, you, you, you don't feel as good. Kerwin Sutherland says, yeah, Stockton is on the higher end of adjunct pay that he's seen. So now at this point, my contract has expired with, with Delaware State. I was like nine months, 10 months, I, I think I chose, but I am teaching summer classes. So I reach out to HR to find out like, oh, so what's going on with this, this paperwork for the fall? Right. And it's like, oh, what? And this this is another thing. And I'm not just going to put this on the HBCU, but it's HBCU ish. Where it's just like, we got you. You know, you know how we get what? Yo, I got you, fam. We, we got you. You good. Now, you good might be I might get it in like October. You know, what I mean, you good, man. I might get it in, in November, December, but I'm, I'm good, apparently. So I asked the question just about the hiring and I was just like, so I was told that there's a hiring freeze across the, the university and, and the, the HR representative. She said, yeah, there is. I said, S but that doesn't seem like that would impact something like a quote unquote promotion moving from one level to another. So a lecture two to assistant professor. She said, oh, no, no, no. They just got to fill out some paperwork. Right. Something brief. I said, yeah, that's what I figured. Mind you, because I've seen, you know, the, we get emails. If you work at a university, you get these mass emails, like somebody gets makes tenure. So in the social work department, we got like three, at least three emails saying, congratulations, they fulfilled the requirements for tenure. So they good. They're going to get some more money. They filled out this paperwork, whatever it is, right? Because um, there's a change that's taking place. So with me, I was just like, yeah, I kind of figured that. You know, so if you're not familiar with my get down, I speak truth to power at all times. I don't give a fuck about bureaucracies at all. Chain of commands I do not care about. Tell my students the same thing, right? I tell learners the same thing. Hey, ideally, and I had this happen earlier in this summer semester, the first week, uh, I had a, a, a colleague reach out to me and say, yeah, so we had some students you know, reach out because they were unsure of your grading. But then we had another student who, who said plain out what it was. But I hadn't heard from the students. And so I've reached out. I sent everybody an email because that's that's the, that's my get down. I sent everybody an email. and was just like, listen, I ain't got no problem with y'all advocating on behalf of yourselves. Right. That's if you feel like you need to circumvent me to get some answers that you need to do, handle your business. But I'm the type of person you can come to if you got questions, comments, concerns. I'm not going. I'm not going to BS you. I'm, I'm going to show you grace. I'm going to show love. But I'm also going to, you know, I'm going to tell you the real. I'm going to tell you what's going on. And, and so I say that to say I'm not against jumping over somebody's head to get an answer. With that being said, um, part of the reason why I I had to leave DHS abruptly, <laughs> but that's an, another story for another day. Um, so I emailed, so with regards to this situation, I emailed the, the, the chair, I emailed the associate dean, and I emailed the dean. I was in my, I went to chat GPT, I said, put this shit politely. <laughs> you know what I mean? Because I got, and this is why I'm not against artificial intelligence. I took, because what I had, listen, I'm a Scorpio. I feel things very in, intensely. So I was like, all right, I'm not going to be able to calm a little bit. I took what I wrote, put in chat GPT. They added a kindly, right? They added some, some, some words that helped calm it down a little bit. But what I said in that was the same thing I said earlier, before this person said I was a unicorn. I said, listen, these white universities want me. And that's, that's no lie, right? But the fact is, I've committed myself to saying, you know what? I will only be a full-time professor at a black university. That's a labor of love. So my little 60K that I might be making here 
my homegirl, she went to University of Maryland, Baltimore County. She said, she was working at Dell State too. She said, fuck this. I'm cool. I'm out. I see it because she was, she had the role of a field instructor. And we know that they shouldn't be using the term field now. <laughs> uh, but she was the, she was the, 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 not field instructor. She was the, she ran field. I, I can't think of the role right now. Somebody tell me because I know, y'all know I know what I'm talking about. Or y'all know what I'm talking about. But um, she was like, yo, I'm out of here. I'm not getting any support. They won't give me an assistant. So field director. There we go. Um, and so she went to University of Maryland, Baltimore County. She runs the Women's Center there, making 30000 more than she made at Dell State. A dope educator. Somebody that the HBCU needs. Because the fact of the matter is, None of us going to get paid like the people like Howard at these pro private universities, even even the social workers, the social work professors at Howard aren't making what your Nicole Hannah Jones, your Ta-Nehisi Coates, what uh, Claire Huxtable was getting when she was there. It's just the fact of the matter. But when you got talent and this goes for a lot of a lot of places. Uh, a lot of places, right? Not just in, in in academia, where the individuals and their skill set is not valued. They think it's replicable. And so she up and left. Now she making thirty thousand more. She happier. Her mental health is is thriving. And I'm over here like, yo, I'm just asking for a level up as I as I start this this career track. Now, me being a flower child, I might, you know, it was a, it's a possibility. I might say in a year, nah, you know what, I'm going to go do something else. Let me go make movies. Let me go make documentaries. Let me go back to school. That's what I've been flirting with anyway. And I might, I'm might i going to talk about Eddie Irizarry um, after I, I, I finish talking about this and go be a lawyer, right? Go go do some uh, some activist work in, in that realm. Um. But just the, the lack of value. So I, I wrote this and, and I put all this in. I got a response from the chair. And I had to let my, my homegirl, Tay, read it because it was going to enrage me. She read it and was just like, yeah, Sam, we, we value you. We recognize the work you put in. I'm just waiting to hear from the dean. The same thing he said like two months ago. And granted, that may very well be the case. So I'm like, ah, oh, all right. So I'm like, cool. Sitting here thinking about what my moves are going to be. Yesterday, fast forward. So this was like July, mid-July. Because I, I don't, I don't stop. I don't, I, let me take that back. Let me change my wording. Listen, I'm not going to go hunt people down and try to prove to them my worth. That's, that's, not, that's not the space I operate from. You either see it or you don't. I'm, I'm not, I'm not, what, what the white lady say, Brene Brown, I'm not hustling for my worthiness. Not at a Negro institution, a place where it should be embraced. But again, HBCUs tend to operate like how we think predominantly white institutes, institutions operate. So I sent the, I, I sent the dean's secretary a, a letter. Oh, not a letter, uh, an email requesting a forthwith meeting. Again, I had to go to Chad GPT because I needed some some kind words in there. And so they put kindly in again. I think Chad GPT likes kindly. So I um and I and I let me see what Crystal says. Some places look at play from an equity standpoint opposed to pay for performance and impact. You want to find a value of a place, look at their budget. Indeed, with Dell State being a, a state institution, right? So the, 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 these Everything is collective bargained. Um, hence the reason why we saw a lot of issues in, in at Howard. I'm not sure they're I know they're a private institution. I'm not sure you know if they're unionized and, and how unionized they are and the strength of the union because there were individuals who weren't getting paid. So at like Stockton as an adjunct, I'm in the union. At Dell State, that's not the not the case. You an outsider until you become full time. So, but there, there are specific, so I say that to say there are specific like steps, specific positions or, or what have you. So I sent an email requesting a forthwith meeting and I never do this. I attached a read, a read receipt and it was read at 9 a.m. We going on, we about to go on Wednesday. Still haven't heard from them. 
And so I'm at a place now and the semester starts on Monday. So where I'm at now, and I, I appreciate this is therapeutic for me because I've been I've been upset and frustrated all day. I didn't even record a, a You Good Man episode today with my man Mike. But I'm protesting and my protest is, yeah, I'm going to teach these classes until I don't want to teach them anymore. But it's hard when you're committed to the student and I'm not I'm not committed to the institution. I'm committed to the to the learners. So when I have learners who who thank me for for pushing them to, to think critically, not just allowing them to, to skate by as they may do in their other classes and, and recognizing the value that they have and, and the, the intellect that they have, not being as, as stringent when it comes to things regarding sub, work submission and, and yada, yada, yada. That's who I'm committed to. Again, but what Dr. Carr says, he says that when we look at the institution, who the foundation of the institution is the learner and the educator. Everybody else helps facilitate that relationship. But what we see in academia far too often is that though the further you get away from the core, the more problematic it becomes. And you find yourself in limbo, in, in my case, as a result of politics, as a result of lack of concern. Who's going to advocate for me in the way that I need, but for me? The chair is tenured. Other professors are tenured. They, cool, they Gucci, right? Which will lead you to think, yo, we will be on top of this to make sure we push for this. But this is where you become, a, you're a seat filler. And we, when we start questioning your dedication to, to, to true education, the original idea of education. See, when we look at the HBCU, and I got the book back here somewhere. Um, where is it? I, I, don't, I can't find it right now. But Kerwin says, her, Dell State is challenged to deal with in so many areas. And, uh, agree. When we think about the idea of the HBCU in general, Part of the idea was we're going to go here as, a, as learners. We're going to go here to get an education so we can bring back to the community and help community. And what's lost in all of this is this idea of community. And, you, and it's palpable. You can tell because when you when you and you realize that, it, but this is where you realize, like it's a, it's a capitalistic entity. It's about the bottom dollar, the bottom line. So when they care about their ranking for for U.S. World News and Report, when they first said that, that the, in their first faculty meeting and said their ranking and they were happy about it, I said, when does this become the game? This isn't how how what I've known HBCUs in particular to be about. But this is where, again, you get caught up in what they do. You get caught up in what they do. But this is when you have those, those elite white universities. And I'm not, I don't want to say, get the names wrong off the top of my head. I feel like one of them was Yale or it may have been Penn. Like, yeah, we don't want to be ranked in your joint. We not worried about that. We cool. You know what I'm saying? Like, like think about that. Because they know they value. They know they worth. We motherfucking Yale. We MF and Harvard. We MF and Penn. We not chasing some fictitious white dream in this academic space. And so for me, my protest is, and this will be until either they, like, yo, you you ain't show up to a, to a faculty meeting all year. Nah, I haven't, B. I have no desire. And if they ask me the reason, that's going to be the reason. But I'm, I'm, I'm still contemplating. Because, but this is when Tupac talks about, you know, this is why you don't see no loudmouth 30-year-olds. It's like they take the heart and soul out of a black man. He says this on Mortal Man, on, on Kendrick Lamar album, which is an old interview from like the 19, early 90s when he was over in like Sweden or Switzerland or another, somewhere. But it's this idea that a lot of us are in spaces where we don't want to be. And 
because we got it, when we talk about taking the heart and soul from a black man, it's the notion that it's the idea that I have bills. I'm raising kids uh, because because what will happen if I, if I just stop, if I pick up and just say, you know what? Forget this. I'm cool. I'm done. Yeah, you might be homeless. That and again, that's another conversation for another day when we talk about this idea of afford affordable housing. I just saw somebody who touts that they offer affordable housing, offering a a, a two bedroom apartment, a, a two bedroom house, or something for eighteen hundred dollars a month. They like, what are we talking about here? But I, I but I digress. So I just bring up that that HBCU situation and where I stand in the academy to to just highlight we we it's good that we hold HBCUs in in high regard. We should as a as a hub for Black folk to just come convene at a basic level. But a lot of that is effed up. And it's going to meet the same fate no matter how much enrollment increases because the, the, the spirit of it is lost. The spirit of what it truly is, is lost. So with that said, to this, this next conversation, and feel free to tap in if you, if you want. I'm not bougie with it. So today... And, and within the last like two weeks or so, I've been posting about Eddie Irizarry, who is a, a Hispanic brother, young Hispanic brother, I believe he was in his early 20s, who was murdered by Philadelphia police within the last two weeks. Initially, uh, Danielle Outlaw, who is the police commissioner, she came out in her press conference and said that Eddie had gotten out of the car. He had lunged at the police officers with their not with the knife and they shot him dead. Lo and behold, like 48 hours later, they came back out and said, Oh, my bad. The information was wrong. Apparently he was still in the car. More information started to come out. Well, you know what? Not only was he in the car, and it may or may not have been a knife visible, but his window was rolled up. And he was shot and killed. Which for me are red flags. Sound the alarm. But today, today, and I never watch police videos like well you know it's I'm it's, it's gonna be time for me to replay my man Kerwin uh, Sutherland poem against uh, uh, about these police videos and just the impact that it has on a community I don't watch them because I'm not trying to get secondary trauma um, as a result of watching I do share because I believe there is a purpose in sharing which is highlighted with this Eddie Irizarry case, but I'll get to that in a, in a few minutes. What came out today the, the, was the video, it looks like from, from a, an outdoor camera on somebody's house, and it shows the police drive. Now, allegedly he was driving down a one-way street erratically. Um, he stopped, they came up and confronted him. In the video, you see him coming up the street, you see him stop, you see him back up a little bit. And it's on my page if you haven't seen it. Police sped down the street, came, hopped out of the car. And let me slow down when I say this. Sped down the street. Hopped out of the vehicle. With guns drawn. The officer ran around the car and started shooting. Let's rewind. Because I rewinded the video. Because I said, that happens kind of fast. He got out the car. I started counting. One, two, three, four, five seconds. 
and six shots were fired. And it wasn't as slow as my count. And even that count right there was exaggerating. And I was taken aback by what I saw. I just watched someone get murdered on camera and I watched the coward run away and retreat after shooting six times, after being the aggressor. Not trying to administer any type of help, not trying to see what had taken place. Was he alive? Was he not alive? But I saw the coward retreat. And I'm not going to, I don't even want to say his name. I was flustered. I posted the video all on social media. In the video account that you see on my page, you can hear the gasps and the crying from the relatives of Eddie Irizarry because I took it from the press conference that was had today. Like, this person is still walking the streets. This individual is still walking the streets. They get the benefit of the doubt. They get due process. Something that the ordinary folk don't get. And this is where we say this idea of qualified immunity is, is bull job. But Monty Jones, who I listen to on a regular basis, and this was back during the Ahmaud Arbery, uh, Breonna Taylor, George Floyd uh, murders that took place. He, he proposed that cops operate under the fundamental premise, the premise that some people got to die in order for them to do their job effectively. It's like you're carrying a whole bunch of eggs. Some of them might get cracked. That's just the name of the game. And so when we when we when we look at it from that perspective, I can definitely see why police think and and the the the, the unions come out in defense and the public, some public folk come out in defense. And, and ask their questions. Well, what did they do to deserve this? That's the question that I had somebody ask me on, on TikTok. Because they believe, first, that they believe that this faux idea of, of, of hero, uh, them being heroes. Now, you signed up for this. You signed up for this job. You signed up for this responsibility. And so you don't become a hero for something that you signed up for. You're risking your life out of choice. A hero is somebody who's walking down the street. They happen to see a fire like the like the brother who said when they were throwing the babies out the window and he was catching them. Unlike Aguilar, he is a hero. Because that's that, that he's just an ordinary citizen. And so when you don that suit. When you don that clown out that that clan outfit. You no longer can be in the hero discussion. So um, I, I started thinking about it from from that perspective. Then I started wondering within the last two weeks why there has been little outrage, not only from the public, but from political officials here in the city of Philadelphia. We're in election season. There's this woman, Sherelle Parker, who is all about this cons this idea of stop and frisk, constitutional stop and frisk, even though I argue there's no such thing. Right? There's no such thing as constitutional stop and frisk. There's no way to infringe upon somebody's personal space without bringing your biases without bringing preconceived notions about the community with whom you're policing is no way. But I was wondering why I didn't hear from her. I don't think I heard a statement from Jim Kenney, who is the current mayor. Some folks say he'd been a lame duck for a few years and he'd been, he, he'd been said, nah, I'm, I'm good. I'm Gucci. City council people haven't heard from him. Why? Maybe it's because it's not your district. I'm not sure how that operates. State representatives haven't heard from them. 
people who I respect, people who I admire, other, other, other individuals within the community who are quote unquote prominent black folk, prominent brown folk. I just saw an ad from 76, for 76ers place and this was from like March or April unbeknownst to me. But I saw this ad and it had, I'm not going to name the people who I saw advocating for, for 76ers place because it's going to drum up black businesses. They're donating money. It's going to help the economy. When they disregard what their Chinese, their Chinese brethren are saying. Right? Just disregarding that. Now, nah, because we focusing on black and brown. That's when we talk about this idea and, and how problematic and pervasive white supremacy is. Because it will have you looking at individuals who are who are who are being oppressed by the same systems. And will have you perpetuating those same those same ideas. Yes, JPZ is less than two weeks old. I didn't hear from any of them. I haven't saw a statement. Nothing. And it makes you think when we talk about when folks say they, they, they care about community. We know this isn't the truth. We know that folk care about their standing and care about perception more so, more so than the work. Again, some of these people are doing some, some good stuff in the community. But this is one of them ones. This is one of those incidents. For no other fact than the police commissioner got up there and told a bold-faced lie due to bad intel. So it makes you think, again, these two individuals, these two cops, they sat and got their story straight. This is what we're going to tell the brass when they come. What happens? Because when you're in fight, flight, freeze, or fawn, you got to make a decision right then and there. You're not thinking about the, the security cameras that are catching this on tape to debunk your lies. But this goes to show that, again, the brass are like, we're going to take your word for it. Because why? No other reason then you're wearing this clan outfit. Dig what I'm saying? And I got homies I'm cool with. Let's, let's be clear. I got homies who I'm cool with. My, my man Dave. Good brother. But he dons the clan outfit as well. Good brother. Don't got a bad word to say about him. Except when he put on that outfit. Because we understand the origins of the police here. In America. So not only do we have individuals who are just ignoring what's taking place, your prominent folk, your political folk, you got the people. Hence the reason why I'm I'm not surprised that the videos that I've put up haven't been shared a whole bunch of times. I'm not shocked. Because what it takes is it takes a perfect storm for something to, to, to catch national attention, local attention. It takes a perfect storm. The only reason that George Floyd became such a national story, a polarizing moment, a lightning rod across the globe, it's not because it was caught on camera. It's not because he was being choked out on camera. For for how many minutes? What's the what's the number for Dave Chappelle special? It was because we the world was shut down. Nobody could go anywhere. Nobody could do anything. All you had was your phone. The world was on ice. You think of George Floyd and it shows the cops have killed more people post George Floyd than in a few years prior to George Floyd's murder. 
So what does that show you? And and yes, it's on it's on camera. So what does that tell you? What that tell you is it was a perfect storm. And unfortunately for Eddie Irizarry, it's not a perfect storm. It's the end of the summer. You got kids going back to school, kids going back to college, people taking their vacations, coming back from vacations. It's a lot of moving around. Outside of the fact that that your your traditional media, and when I say traditional media, we talking about white media. They're not leading with this story nonstop. It hasn't hit national news at this point. Although I do believe I saw something in the New York Times, which is what behind a paywall. Hence the reason why I say that the outrage is so small. It's so limited. You know what will help that? If the family's spokesperson, their attorney, was a Ben Crump. If it was a, uh, if he was a Lee Merritt. If he was a Philly's own Michael Core. Salute to him being honored by Cheney University. You might be, Phil, what do you mean? When I posted that video of Eddie Irizarry, I went and looked for Shaka Johnson's social media. Couldn't find it. So a Twitter account from 2012. On IG, I just couldn't find it at all. You know, I'm not searching on Facebook. That means something when we're talking about taking a local story and making it national. What that does is that galvanizes the people. When Ben Crump posts something, the world takes notice. And it's not to cast aspersions on Shaka Johnson by any means. I hear he's a strong attorney. But if you're going to be in this space, handling a case like this, you have to be able to touch every space. Holding a press conference with the news media might come, the biased news people who all they just want to report on is, is murders to have folk thinking that the world is unsafe. When historically speaking, the United States of America is as safe as it's ever been in history. But you wouldn't know that if you go to a Ma Fox Philly. Because that's not their job. Their job is to drive, is, is, to, is, is to get clicks. Their job is to have salacious headlines. And what's more, more salacious than, than gun violence, murder, especially of black folk? So unfortunately, for Eddie Rosari's family, this might not get the attention that it deserves. I'm not going to tell you what's happening with, with, with Larry Krasner. Right? That's not my man. You know, I don't, I don't advocate for the legal system in any capacity. However, truth is, this person's still on desk duty after we saw him shoot somebody six times. within five seconds of exiting his vehicle. When we talk about solutions, I don't, I don't know what the solution is in this. And my part is to, yo, make sure I'm sharing this video with hopefully a thoughtful caption, hopefully to have people thinking, hence the reason why I put five seconds from exiting his vehicle so people can see how quick that is. So people can realize and I've driven down a, one, a wrong one-way street before in North Philadelphia around Temple University. You think it's a, a regular street, the next thing you know is one way. And, and all it takes is going down a one way, making that mistake for somebody to come down, hop out the car five seconds and shoot you? Knife or no knife? What if you're a chef? What if you want to carry a knife for, your prote for protective purposes? God forbid it was a gun or a cell phone case. We've seen that before too. 
but there's this disconnect that exists in this 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 world of social justice and I don't think as somebody who 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 finds themselves occupying this space of of black liberation and advocating on behalf of folk of the global majority there's this disconnect man and it's a result of of capitalism patriarchy white white imperialism white supremacy i i got the order mixed up but what bell hook said hopefully the return in the next century or so is back to community because if not we are all doomed listen i'm going back to watch the office appreciate y'all peace